So <laughs> um, I think that mm. is all. And with that, uh, I'm excited to welcome all of our panelists today. This is Alan Turnquist. Uh, Alan, if you could uh, introduce yourself and um, give us a little background on this project and why UW Madison and the agroecology uh, program is interested in conservation grazing. Sure, that's a good place to start. I'm kind of going to assume there's a real general audience here, so I'm going to make some broad comments, <laughs> and I think everybody else is going to be able to dive into mm -hmm. the details a little bit more. So um, my official title here is a, a graduate coordinator with the Agroecology Master's Program, and uh, in that role, I kind of serve um, a function with students and also with faculty, and I'm kind of the, the center hub for what's a really interdisciplinary program. So um, Likewise, uh, that kind of coordinator role has uh, translated over to this project too, where I've been able to kind of sit at the middle of things and help keep some of the, the pieces together. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'll just start right away with um, kind of some of the motivations uh, for this work um, and, and then dive into a couple of the ways that we're looking to do it. Um, so um, just as, as, as a context, um, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, I'll probably just say DNR, <laughs> um, use, um, they manage thousands of acres of grasslands across the state. Um, you know, and the, the grasslands do not manage themselves um, left to their own um, devices without input. Uh, there tends to be sort of a, a succession of woody plants and eventually a transition to a forest. So um, the DNR has their boots on the ground doing um, a number of activities to maintain the open habitat um, that's important for different grassland uh, bird species and invertebrates. So they're out there doing prescribed burns, um, using a brush hog to mow, uh, even using herbicides or a combination of all three. So I think that's kind of the first mm -hmm. important contextual um, piece of this puzzle is that the DNR is actively managing an awful lot of uh, grassland habitat out there. Um, and at the same time, uh, we have a lot of grass-based uh, agricultural producers in Wisconsin. Um, you know, primarily um, um, for this project, we're interfacing with, um, with beef uh, producers, but there's also potential to interface with dairy producers, particularly with um, um, like heifers and cows that they're not milking um, at the time. So um, right away, you kind of start to see that there's this scenario where um, for um, a producer, uh, a potential limiting factor for how many animals they can have and how much they produce is their access to land and quality forage. Uh, and um, for the Department of Natural Resources, um, there's kind of this continual uh, effort to find more efficient ways to meet conservation objectives and kind of keep those grasslands open. And so this project in collaborative here really looks to um, understand um, what the potential is um, for a win-win scenario with uh, private graziers um, putting their animals on publicly mm -hmm. held grasslands um, with, for conservation objectives. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a pretty diverse group of people who are involved. Uh, we have great representation here from UW and the Department of Natural Resources and also a, a private grazier, but um, there have been others um, that have been involved, and particularly I want to mention the Pasture Project that's part of the Wallace Center. They've been a really key partner in this. Uh, they bring all sorts of expertise to the table. So the Pasture Project has you know, a very broad goal of um, improving water quality in uh, the upper Mississippi watershed and all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, which is no small task, right? But um, one of the ways that they're um, kind of trying to move forward with this is to improve the viability of grass-based agriculture and grazing. And so um, they've really been able to come in and, and bring some expertise um, in, uh, in a couple of particular ways. Um, first of all, um, as you probably imagine, there, is, um, there are a lot of questions that, that kind of pop up when you're talking about um, putting producers on um, the publicly held grasslands. There's, uh, you know, from the producer side, all sorts of questions about everything from kind of bottom line, how do I make this work, to like health and safety of animals, um, and frankly, just the obstacle maybe of mm. getting over the hump of talking to a land manager at the Department of Natural Resources um, and figuring out some of those details. And, you know, from the DNR land manager perspective, there's also a real challenge with um, thinking about how grazing is kind of part of this toolkit to keep grasslands open. Like, when is it appropriate? Under what circumstances? How are we measuring the, the impact of this? Uh, 
And so those are all kind of the core questions that we're, we're trying to look at here. And the pasture project, um, I, I want to just give them a, a couple more um, kind of rec points of recognition here since they're not going to be able to speak for themselves. They, they've really been important where the rubber meets the road there between the producers and the land managers. There's kind of a meeting of the minds and eventually a, a contract and, and a grazing plan that comes out of this. And so the grazing plan details all sorts of important things like the number of cows on the landscape, you know, the density um, figures, the, the timing of it, um, considerations like fencing and water and all the practical implications, like it requires a real expertise that can kind of bridge that gap between producers and conservation uh, professionals. So they've been able to do that. Also the network of producers that they have across the state to be able to um, identify producers in a given area that might be um, prospective um, collaborators has also been really important. And finally, um, they have contributed to what for all of us has been this kind of ongoing capacity building, you know, understanding when is it appropriate to um, think about um, using uh, animals on the landscape as a conservation method. You know, what can it do? Um, what can it do? And so uh, we've had some really great kind of meetings where there's members of the Department of Natural Resources and private producers and Pasture Project and the University of Wisconsin researchers all really talking about what some of these key questions are to help us kind of refine as we as we move forward. So um, I guess the last part of your question was about the agroecology program and, and why are we involved. So um, as I mentioned, we're a highly interdisciplinary program. Uh, a lot of students come to us because they want to um, research and think about agriculture in a, like a broader context of society and environment. And this project is, you know, a perfect example of that. Um, likewise, we interface with faculty all across campus. So um, we have um, representatives and um, affiliates in over 20 departments on campus. So, um, you know, from the beginning in discussions with the Department of Natural Resources and private producers, it was obvious there were a lot of questions that came out. So. Um, we were able to kind of identify um, key faculty members on campus that could start to address some of these questions so that we could put some research behind um, all of the efforts and the pilot projects that are going on to try to better understand what some of the outcomes are. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and leave it for Great. questions. And thanks. Cool. I think we'll move on to Aaron for the kind of DNR perspective. So it seems like at first um, inviting cattle onto uh, wildlife natural area might run in contrast to some of your goals. Could you talk a little bit about um, like why this was a good fit or um, if it if having those animals on the land um, help with some of your goals as a land manager or mm -hmm. if it presents any obstacles? Yeah, so um, if I could just really briefly mm -hmm. share a little bit about Buena Vista Wildlife Area. Um, it's approximately 14,000 acres, so it's one of the largest contiguous grasslands we have in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of land to manage. Um, we call it a surrogate grassland system, which it doesn't have a high native component, but it has those large parcels of grasslands, which many of the wildlife species um, in Wisconsin require. So it's that unique opportunity. <clears throat> um, so that's just a little bit about, so to give you some context for, for where this project is working in particular. Um, and grazing was not new to the property as a whole. Um, it had been conducted there for decades prior to my being there about 10 years ago. It was done in a continuous grazing system, so producers would lease land, uh, DNR would build the infrastructure and the fence, and then they would put their animals in at the beginning of the season during the spring, and then they'd take them out. There was no movement. Um, they were left in there and monitors and the pastures were monitored. So it was, <clears throat> For some, it was kind of a new idea, but us at the property, we've been doing it for a while. The, the new part for us was, as we were you know, working with these grazing and these ranchers, learning that, well, there's this system or what not, managed grazing, management intensive grazing. So essentially moving the animals within the pasture system. So that was something that we wanted to explore some more. Um, and that kind of was the impetus for the beginnings of these conversations. But really the goals on the property with grazing as a whole and specifically with management intensive grazing is to you know create a diversity of structure within that grassland a lot of the species wildlife species present um, 
this, that structure is most important as opposed to what species are actually there, whether it be warm season native grasses or cool season non-native grasses. So to increase that structural diversity, some areas that are shorter, some areas that are taller, and then of course we always leave areas that are undisturbed during the nesting season, which is especially critical. Um, and also to provide a increased diversity of species. We have some areas that are pretty monotypic stands of um, some native species, some not native species. So we just want to break those up like a little bit and provide like uh, a species structure diversity. Um, also, you know, as Alan said, if we leave the grasslands to their own devices, succession will take place. We'll get some brush. So we also wanted to see if we can use cattle in this management intensive grazing and reduce the amount of brush that we have. Um, and then also we're always looking for ways to be um, inventive, try new things. And if there's something that we can do as a department to perhaps reduce the amount of time we spend in a tractor or reduce the amount of uh, excuse me, herbicides we use, then it's a win for us as well. Just trying to be as efficient as we can with the dollars that we have and the, the people power and time that we have. So those are some of the bigger um, or the habitat goals on the property. And then, of course, you know, looking to build those partnerships with agriculture and learn as much as we can about this tool. It's, it's adding to our box. We're not looking to take anything away in terms of all of the other management techniques we use. We're just looking, is this something that we can add? <laughs> What's the location of this property? It's in uh, Southwest Portage County. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great, and I'm sorry, what was your title within? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a wildlife technician. Okay, great. Yep. I think Bill will have, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Bill Kalaji. Um, I'm a grazing specialist with Marathon County. Uh, I grew up in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, Portage County. So I was real familiar with the area, the Buena Vista Marsh area. In fact, I drive through it all the time and just, it reminded me of, of the West. I was a soil scientist in Idaho for a few years back in the 80s. And, and so I really felt at home in that grassland. And so when Aaron came to me in 2013 uh, to talk about possibly running my cattle uh, on, on, in the Buena Vista, I thought, man, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to spend more time out there and maybe be a part of the bigger picture. Um, so initially, I thought, man, this is a win-win for me. Uh, you know, <laughs> gobs and gobs of land with all kinds of grass. Uh, but my concerns were is working with the DNR, uh, uh, wildlife. I, <laughs> did it come out that way? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, uh, I mean, at least, uh, you know, you know, rumors had it that uh, wildlife folks considered a cow the death of, of habitat. Um, <laughs> and in many cases, cattle can do a lot of damage to wildlife habitat. Um, so my concern was working with someone that could be quite negative towards cattle. Uh, and, uh, and my other concern was, man, it's way out there. Uh, there's no power. There's no utilities. Who's going to, you know, be watching my cattle when I'm not? Uh, uh, you know, and however, I used to go every day to move them. Um, so my big concerns was working with the staff and the distance and the drive. And, and quite frankly, that isn't the problem. Uh, the, the DNR staff is quite easy to work with and, and works well. I guess the drive is, is challenging. Probably the most interesting thing is that I just assume there's gobs and gobs of grass, but there's these large monocultures of, of these target species of goldenrod. Goldenrod is good in moderation, apparently, for native species. Native species mm -hmm. But there's oceans of goldenrod with no grass whatsoever underneath it. Um, and training my cattle to eat these target species mm -hmm. was was challenging. You know, knapweed seemed to be quite easy because I had trained my livestock to eat knapweed on my home place uh, in the northern Portage County on some sands. Um, Spirea was another target species that they took to pretty good. Uh, what, I, what I would do is I'd use a molasses and salt mixture and kind of spray it onto the, onto the target species and introduce them to eat some. Uh, I guess first I would look, I did look it up, each species, make sure it wasn't poisonous. Uh, and, uh, 
Well, they took to uh, the spirea, uh, they ate that pretty well. Trees, well, anyone that runs livestock, if you have one tree in a pasture, they'll, they can take care of that. They, they'll go itch on it. And so that didn't take a lot of training um, to knock down these, these taller trees that was a target to get rid of. However, goldenrod is, is challenging. We're, we're getting some success. Uh, just with trampling, with frequent moves, doing daily moves, it's an increase in labor. Um, but uh, the more frequently, move, more frequently I move the cattle, the more anxious they're off to eat anything or try anything. So, uh, it's, so I let them into a, a fresh piece of ground, and they'll go take a bite of goldenrod before their buddy can. It's kind of one of them deals, and hopefully they'll learn to do this. The other plant uh, that we're finding a little tougher to manage is uh, musk thistle. Uh, however, last year, at least during one part of the growing season, I got the cattle to eat every seed head off, so I thought I had it mastered, but it seems the following week they... Yeah, still working on it. <laughs> uh, they chose not to eat it. Um, they forgot. They forgot. Uh, I guess the, the most challenging, or what I didn't expect, was the forage. It appears to be a lot of forage out on these grasslands, but there really isn't um, a lot of dry matter. So the cattle get a lot of exercise walking around to, uh, to get a belly full. So uh, the rate of gain has been decent the first couple of years. We've had some issues, but it, it's, a, it's a large area, so the cattle put a lot of miles on. And we have yet to figure out if that's good or bad, but they do walk around a lot um, just because the grass is quite thin. Um, our goals are to uh, introduce some Forbes. Uh, this year we're going to, uh, again, this isn't new, we, a couple years ago we interceded some red clover. Didn't have the, I wouldn't, as a farmer, I don't consider it a great success. Um, uh, but this year we're going to try introducing um, some clovers uh, to the pastures uh, to add some forage quantity and quality. Um, my observations were the red clover was planted a couple of years ago, um, uh, at least last year. I should say early on I, in the project in 2015, 2014 was the first year, oh, 2015. The first year out, anyhow, it wasn't until July till I seen my first prairie chicken. Uh, I didn't think they existed. <laughs> um, 2015, uh, seen three or four and flushed one right in front of a, a group at a pasture walk, which I thought was perfect, um, <laughs> perfect timing. However, last year where the red clover is coming in, uh, at least in the fall, there were groups of 20, at least in the fall when there was something for them to eat. Uh, so there was just gobs of prairie chickens for a week or two in the fall as they went through this, this clover area. Um, and it's interesting, it's nice to be a part of that. Um, all in all, uh, I still think there's challenges out there just to get uh, uh, more forage quality. And I think that's a management, that's what's nice about rotational grazing. Um, there's no recipe for any rotational grazing plan. So if they're writing a grazing plan for Southern Wisconsin, Western Wisconsin, or even side by two parcels next to each other, it really depends on the manager, the cattle, and, uh, and you know, a little bit of luck on what you need to do or what you can do to in improve the forage quality and quantity. So our goal is this year is to maybe get cattle out a little earlier, skip a few areas. Um, there's uh, some areas of warm seasons that were planted, and we're going to try encouraging that by not grazing it or, or choosing when to graze it um, and how hard to graze it. Um, maybe target these areas of goldenrod with the interseeding and maybe get some uh, grasses, uh, the naturalized grasses in, not necessarily native, but naturalized, smooth brome and what's naturally growing out there uh, to get a little more diversity in these, these monoculture seas of, of uh, either spirea or goldenrod, um, which seems to bring a lot more wildlife out there. Thanks so much. Jacob, do you want to introduce yourself? A little sure. bit about your role in the project? Yeah. Um, so my name is Jacob Grace. I'm a graduate student in the University of Wisconsin-Madison Agroecology Program. 
and um, I'm one of several uh, students in the agroecology program working on this project. And um, part of why we're involved in this project is because it's a great example of agroecology in action. So agroecology is all about thinking about agricultural land as an ecosystem. And so that's a big part of this project, trying to incorporate some agricultural practices into um, getting the ecosystem to function more normally. And um, agroecology is also really interested in how um, uh, sociology and how economics influence what actually happens on the land. So that's also a big part of this project is making sure that the partnerships work out and making sure that the economic side of it works out. So uh, what I've been looking at for my research is looking at the plant response to grazing. So how the forage is responding and especially how these woody shrubs are responding and whether grazing is actually reducing them. Um, but then for the full spectrum of agroecology, we have also had a student looking at the grassland bird response to grazing. So bringing in some of the ecological elements. Uh, we had a student look at the economic side of grazing and try to figure out what some of the price points might be for, um, for the farmers who might be doing this grazing. Um, and then we have a student who's taking more of an evaluation role, kind of looking at the social side of this project to see what are the things that make it a win-win for the DNR and for the private graziers. And so um, this project is a great opportunity for us to kind of do our research in the field. And then it's also a great opportunity to do research that actually gets used and is useful to people. So I think that's kind of our main role is to um, do research that then can immediately be useful at these sites and to the DNR. Right. So despite Aaron and Bill's um, pretty positive, generally positive um, reaction to this project, could you talk about some of the limitations or what we do and don't know about limitations and opportunities of uh, grazing as a, as a conservation tool? Yeah. So as I said, my research is looking at whether these plants are being affected by grazing. And I think I started with this question kind of already knowing the answer. And the answer is that it depends. <laughs> and it depends on a lot of different things. It depends on the type of shrubs we're trying to get rid of. It depends on the type of forage that these cattle are grazing. It depends on the type of livestock. And in particular, as Bill was mentioning, it depends on the grazing management. So um, the area that these livestock are in and how long they're in that area can really change how they influence the plants that are there. Um, so what I'm doing at three sites across the state of Wisconsin is uh, right around this time of year, if there weren't snow on the ground, I would be out doing uh, <laughs> stem counts of these woody shrubs to count the stems in my plots and see if the shrubs are declining. Um, after I do the stem counts, I'll go around and do species uh, uh, species composition surveys. So I'll, I'll do surveys of what plant species are at these sites and see if the numbers are changing over time with grazing. And then throughout the grazing season, once the cattle are at these sites, I'll go through and do forage clippings right before they graze to get at some of the questions Bill had about what's the forage quantity and what's the forage quality at these sites. Um, so those are some of the things I'm looking at. And what I'm hoping to do is use this information to start narrowing down what are the situations under which grazing can help reduce these shrubs? What are the species of shrubs it works well on? What types of grazing management does it work well on? Um, and I think some, oh, who is that? <laughs> Sounded familiar. Um, so I think that the, the best results we've seen so far in terms of reducing the shrubs has been at the Buena Vista site with the aspen at least where at least in this past year, I could just tell just from the start of the year to the end of the year, I would go out to my plots and the aspen trees are just coming down all over the place from the cattle, standing, uh, standing under the trees, rubbing up on the trees and spending time around them is really just bringing down some of those woody shrubs. So um, we have uh, future grad students coming onto the project. One of them is here today to keep uh, seeing how this is gonna change. Uh, we'll end up with hopefully four or five years worth of data here, which I think is what we're really going to need to see to to really know how grazing is affecting these woody shrubs. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for us to um, to look at this and to get some results that will be immediately useful to people who are trying to do this. Great, thank you so much. Um, do you all have anything you want to follow up on before we move to audience questions? Anything else you feel that's important to add? I, well, just talking about some of the challenges that. Uh, 
the wildlife managers have. I mean, grazing does require a lot of infrastructure. Water is a huge issue. Cattle require a lot of water. So that's been one of the challenges um, on, not so much on the property that I work at, but those around the state is how do we get good quality water to the animals and in enough supply. And of course, these wildlife management areas are open to the public, therefore hunting, fishing, recreation. Um, so what kind of infrastructure we put in place is always a discussion that's had prior to um, any area being grazed, whether it's electric fence or barbed wire fence, those are always things that we think about and that we consider carefully. Um, but I think for the first year that we did this, there was some initial um, challenges with water and you know that's a, like that's a big life source thing. So that's probably one of the biggest um, challenges. It's not an obstacle. It's a challenge that we work with with grazers and the property managers to make sure that there is a good supply. And that will always be every pasture is going to be different. Every wildlife management area is going to be different. So the the that feeling where it depends that is true for a lot of these challenges. It just really depends where you are and. Um, you know what's available in the area mm -hmm. but not insurmountable it's just some require a little additional thought and planning mm -hmm. Alrighty. i think we'll open it up to the zoom audience first if anybody's willing to turn on their camera that would be great mm -hmm. <laughs> if not we'll move on to you can type it in the chat box or if we have anyone calling in by phone okay. <laughs> anybody in the live audience got some questions yeah Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Richard Benson. I'm a retired farmer down by Platteville. Um, early on in my career, I did have a chance to teach University of Arizona in animal science. A uh, couple questions. Uh, are you, <clears throat> is this all, uh, uh, cow calf operation or feeder cattle? And do you have a, a uh, life, uh, inventory, livestock inventory program that monitors uh, head days, uh, actually a combination of head days and metabolic size and that sort of thing. And also are there, do you consider multi-species like cattle and maybe sheep and goats to take care of some of those uh, browse uh, plants? And one final comment, when I was in, in Arizona, with the ranchers that were dealing with uh, kind of a rest rotation problem, a grazing system, they would tell me that uh, during the rest period, what happened was elk came in after the cattle. And so that, com that complicated their Do you have a, any similar sort of issues uh, in Wisconsin? The well, the cow calf, uh, or the question of, of what I'm running, I'm running a cow calf operation. I do uh, weigh birth weights, weaning weights, and yearling heifer weights. Um, I don't weigh my adult cattle. Um, I have observations of body condition each year. Um, and yeah, for some reason I am declining in, in uh, uh, that bred heifer weights. And it could be many things, you know, last year, you know, Aaron had mentioned water was the biggest problem. Um, we had, I had an issue with a bull that was jumping in a water tank <laughs> and making a mess in there. And yeah. so people weren't getting water on or cattle weren't getting water. So that, that could have been probably the biggest problem with that. Um, other than last year, uh, performance was the industry standard. I was real happy. Um, I had to supplement last year, but again, that was m more with, we, we, I started grazing later in the year. Um, so the grass matured. I didn't get out till mostly till the end of June. So I had a lot of mature grass, so poor quality. So I had cattle um, out in a lot of grass, great habitat, uh, but mm -hmm. poor feed. So they were suffered there a little bit. I can speak to multi-grazing or multi-species grazing maybe. Um, so I'm, I'm working on three different sites throughout the state, um, and there's a variety of cattle being used. So at one of the sites just south of Madison here, they're using Scottish Highland cattle. Um, the first year it was cow-calf pairs, and then last year it was steers. Um, and Scottish Highland cattle tend to browse more than other species, so in some cases they were actually browsing on the shrubs 
themselves. And so we were interested to see that. Um, at my other site, they're uh, grazing dry dairy heifers um, and, and dairy cows, but dry cows. So um, there's kind of a diversity of cattle being used, but we're not really looking at multi-species grazing for at least for any of the sites I'm doing. And I think my understanding for part of why uh, that's our goal is I think the goal is to have something that could be scaled up fairly effectively. And um, I, I don't know how realistic that is with multi-species grazing. I know goats would be an obvious choice for brush reduction. Um, but at one of my sites just south of Madison, um, the land manager had tried contacting goat grazers in the area to see if they might be able to come in and graze the site. And everyone he contacted was booked for two years in advance, he said. So um, I think that's part of why uh, cattle are more the option for this research. I think we're going to take a couple uh, Zoom questions here quickly. Uh, we have a question from Laura that says, uh, what has been the response of hunters and other users of the wildlife area, and what kind of education have you done for this audience? Um, so we do have at each one of these, currently there are four or five grazing sites, and we have uh, Pasture Project partnered, and we made some educational signage to let them know, this is what's happening here, this is why, these are the benefits that we hope to see. Um, there has been some interactions, and like I said, that choice of fence is a pretty big one when you've got pheasant hunters with dogs. Um, you know, there might be a little, you know, a, a learning curve, essentially, and for folks to get the education of this is why we're doing this. We're hoping to make your pheasant hunting better. Um, the few issues that we have had, to my knowledge, have been resolved pretty quickly. Um, where it has been occurring longer, it is less, because folks get used to it, it has been less of, a, of an issue or concern. There are dove hunters that I know that seek some of these areas out because there's water and there's shorter forage. So, you know, there's always going to be a little bit of conflict, but um, for right now at the scale we're at, it's been pretty minimal. But as far as getting the information out to the hunters, and that question, we host a pasture walk each year at our, our uh, grazing area. Uh, we've had articles written in Ag Review and uh, local newspapers. Uh, the Wisconsin DNR magazine had an article on it. Um, so there's been a lot of exposure, at least on our project. Um, and my personal experience being out there every day through the you know early fall has been positive. Uh, but with the hunters knowing that there may be some birds behind my cattle following that herd. So it's, and, and it, at least up where we're at, there, cattle aren't new to anyone in that area. There's been cattle there for decades. So having cattle on the landscape isn't new. Um, and they seem to be knowledgeable about the wire, that it is electrified, because I've never heard anyone complain no. about it. <laughs> Dogs learn pretty quickly. And, well, the, <laughs> well, we have the bottom wire turned off. Uh, we only keep it on for a month in the spring to train my, my smaller calves, but then there's only one hot wire and it's about 40 inches high. So dogs and, and people and critters can run through without getting a shot. Should we take that other Zoom question quick? Um, I think this will be for Aaron again. Uh, how do your DNR peers view this project? This is from Greg. So, you know, we've... <laughs> been approaching it slowly. Um, there's definitely been a lot of interest with anything new. You know, it takes a while. We've been doing this a few years and folks definitely still have questions that they want answered. Um, one of them that I hear quite often is, well, Aaron, you're working in a cool season system. How can we do this on a warm season grass field? So we hope to work with UW Madison and maybe find some of those answers. Um, we're always looking, the other managers are always looking for new opportunities. So I think we're cautiously optimistic and excited about something. Um, the learning curve can be kind of big for a, for a project like this. I mean, we are not trained in livestock management. It's not insurmountable and everybody knows that, but just having somebody with a little, um, to help them along the way goes a long ways with these projects and folks have been excited and really receptive. Um, there's been a few new projects that are slowly getting started on the eastern side of the state. So I, th I think it's taking a really good, cautious um, approach. You know, we're not all jumping in the water at once, but kind of testing the waters and um, looked at pretty positively for the most part. 
You mentioned the Grayson Special Institution. Or? Sure. Um, so currently, Wisconsin is looking to, um, well, they just put on an advertisement to hire a conservation agriculture specialist that will help property managers um, implement grazing agreements, farming agreements on state land and be that go-to person within the department to provide them the support um, for infrastructure, for finding a grazer, for selecting, writing a grazing plan, helping them through farming agreements. So that's something that um, hopefully will happen within the next month or so, get somebody on board um, to provide that support to staff. I think we'll take this uh, last Zoom question here. What kind of leasing rate is set in the lease agreement and how does that compare to a more normal leasing rate on pasture land? And how long is the lease agreement? That's from Nathan. So the best answer is it depends. <laughs> um, obviously these areas on wildlife management areas are not improved pasture. So we can look at, um, you know, county by county pasture rental rates, but we really need to take into account, this is, this is wildland grass. This is not an improved pasture. So the continuous pastures that we have on Buena Vista, um, excluding the rotational grazing just for a moment, put out for a bid process every year. So they are, those other ranchers bid what they feel that they is worth it to them. Um, that way it's fair, they get a pasture. And um, so we use that bid process. I'm not sure what other managers have used in the past. Um, I know some use sweat equity, build the fence, take care of this and take care of this. And then the pasture lease rate is less um, in length. Again, it depends. Bill, we started Bill with a five-year contract. I just extended that. Um, others are two-year contracts, and some of the sets that are continuous are one-year contracts. So it can run the gamut, essentially, depending on how much input is needed up front. Is that a comment? Is that an answer? You can read it off. Okay. Uh, from Suzanne uh, Zipper, it looks like. Uh, related to the economics of grazing, important is increasing the demand for local grass-fed beef. The SLO Farmers Co-op in Northeast Wisconsin has a USDA grant to develop direct sales to consumers. Our goal is to make the economics work for small farms to protect our water-rich area by reducing tillage. Farmers need to get good prices for their product. Thanks, Suzanne. Any comments? Otherwise, I think we can take some other stupid questions. I think back there you were had one of the second ones up. Yeah, I guess my question was just on scalability. Um, what are the limitations to scalability? How do you see this program scaling? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I know mostly about my three specific sites, and so I'm not sure I have a great answer to that question. Um, I guess speaking more from a researcher side, as we start to figure out what the conditions are under which this is most effective, we could start targeting specific sites maybe with certain types of brush or with certain types of cattle that might be available, um, target spots where there are lots of grazers in the area, and figure out how to build upon our strengths. Um, but I don't really know. Do you guys have other thoughts about what? I, I think just, I think one of the obstacles or one of the challenges would be just kind of um, raising awareness that this is a management option to, to try to scale up. I think that's going to be the first thing is, um, yeah, having people know that it's in the toolbox, basically. And just time, time. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, you know, we're kind of here under, there's a lot of partnership involved. So, this doesn't just happen overnight. Um, it takes time to number one, build that partnership even before there are animals on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a, some might see it as a slow process, but once we start building those partnerships with a few and then that gets extended, it's, it's time, logistics, money. It does take money to do the infrastructure. So those are all, I don't have a really great answer for you, but those are, I mean, obviously some of the considerations. I don't know if you want to. On, on the rancher perspective, at least from what I heard, th there's a shortage of people willing to do this. Um, at, to find somebody that to will find someone to day. actually do it, th th there was yeah. only one other rancher that was willing to try that try rotational grazing on yeah. Buena Vista. 
Um, so daily or every other day moves. With daily moves. Yeah. Now, as far as scale of uh, numbers, the Buena Vista is a huge area, so it um, could you produce enough grass-fed beef to feed a fair amount of people, you know, in time. But it's 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 it's, it's something you move at slowly, <laughs> uh, you know, and 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 just you know be a, you know make good observations. Uh, see what's working and and keep heading in the right direction. Uh, uh, up here. Yeah. Um, two general questions. Uh, do you know uh, what the size or the, I guess the con contribution to the Wisconsin economy is comparably from dairying and from beef cattle? Also, what is the uh, size total size of head of cattle, dairy versus beef in the state? It's not like <laughs> um, someone could Google it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, dairy uh, dwarfs the, right. the beef cattle. That's very clearly the leading industry. But you know, there there is potential for uh, dairy farmers to be involved in this. Um, but even among dairy farmers, you're asking a question about um, uh, you know a number of different systems. Only about a quarter of Wisconsin dairy farms use um, employ grass-based systems. You know, some may have a, a some small percentage of a greater percentage of dairy farmers have some access to grass, but um, the confinement operation tends to be the 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 rule increasingly. So, mm -hmm. so that's another um, maybe fact that might tilt those numbers. Um, but actually, in that regard, the beef producers are primarily grass-based in Wisconsin. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think I don't know what how it plays out on these sites. They're um, mostly beef mm -hmm. at this point, mm -hmm. um, and I, I I would anticipate that would probably be true in the long run if, um, as the number of sites expand. Mm -hmm. Back there. Have you uh, tried multi? You talked about multi-species grazing. Have you thrown other things at this like fire, herbicide, or mowing? To get that improved. I know when we were down at Yellowstone 15, 20 years ago, the more things we did, the faster we got this thing turned around. Yep. So that's a, a part of my research that I didn't really mention. So um, I'm, I'm looking at the effects of uh, grazing alone on these shrubs and then also the effect of grazing in combination with herbicide and then also with mowing with the brush cutter to see if those combinations are, well, we would assume they'd be more effective to try to see if yeah, if that could speed up the process a lot more than just turning cattle loose on the site. So, yeah, I think that that looks very promising, especially with the mowing where, you know, the shrubs usually grow back in some form, depending on the species, but then they're often very young and tender and a lot easier for the cattle to just browse directly. So, yeah, we're hopeful about that. Um, yeah, any other comments on that? Well, then we just, did. Um, yeah. I just wanted to just to speak to the um, burning and then grazing that's something that I'm really anxious to try. There's always so many logistics with burning that I don't ever want to count on. And it's really hard to do research on because there's so many factors that need to be met to burn. Uh, that's something that really interests me and I hope I get to do that. Work for INR, working for IODNR, did a lot of work with the Leopold Center in South Central Iowa on burn, patch burn patch grazing. Burn. Yep, and I know there's some folks in uh, Nature Conservancy, I think, that yeah, have, yep. Yeah, doing a little bit of that down in Marlow. Yeah, so hopefully someday. <laughs> <laughs> could, uh, could you talk a little bit about what determines the duration of grazing? I remember when Alan Savory was talking, or at least on the western ranches that I dealt with, it, it wasn't daily, and more closer to a week or so, and they were looking at looking at the grass as opposed to a particular time. Mm -hmm. That for, that might be for me. Yeah. I, I'm I'm choosing daily grazing because I'm trying to encourage uh, my livestock to eat as much of the weeds as they can. Um, it is a it's a, it's very management intensive because the harder I move them and I, I need to watch them every day for room and fill, make sure they're they're performing uh, when I'm giving them these daily moves because it's so so dangerous to give them too little of space. You may not have, like on a normal pasture you may observe that they grazed it too low out in a Buena Vista because there's so many weeds. It's hard to tell 
if it grazed anything at all, because a lot of it is not palatable, uh, the spirea or goldenrod or thistle. So it, you got to rely more on the animal performance and their look each day. So I'm choosing daily moves to get as much trampling as I can of what they don't want to eat. And the more I trample, much like uh, Ellen's TED talk, the more, the more I get trampled, the more I'm observing rhizomas grasses, the smooth brome and quack grass that's out there sneaking into these oceans of uh, goldenrod. So I'm seeing more grass. In fact, uh, from year one, uh, I had 30 pair of cattle out there. To year two, I was able to double that stocking density. Um, but we did get, we've been lucky with weather. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, you know, a drought could trump it all, you know, so, uh, and doing any kind of rising, any kind of clipping, I think, and that'd be what you're doing. A clipping is hard to tell what's really palatable because um, you'd almost have to sort by species because um, goldenrod is essentially, once it heads out, it, at least with my herd, is not palatable. When it's younger, I've had some luck. Um, so I'm choosing daily moves uh, to, ben to get rid of the, the target species as much as I can. I do believe the weekly moves would be easier for the rancher. <laughs> no doubt about it. It's three hours round trip for me each day to go down and move those cows. <laughs> so um, there was 150 head out there last year. And just to add on to that, um, Bill's kind of at the cutting edge. We're, we're lucky to be working with him. But uh, the other two sites that I'm doing research, the cattle are moved every three days to a week or so. So it's a, a longer interval. Yeah. Amanda, go. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Amanda, agroecology alum. And uh, I want to respond to, uh, to something I've just been so struck by throughout the presentation, I came a little late, but uh, also talking about scalability and how it depends is an answer to so many questions and how it, it has to be. Uh, I just want to point out how I'm really struck by how this project crystallizes uh, aims and methods of agroecology that have to do with how knowledge is created. And uh, in this project, knowledge, it has something of an expiration date or the work can only move forward when not by employing some recipe that then can go, but it depends on every day and it depends on the context. It depends on who is involved with the work. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out how this project shows that knowledge is something that is created created collectively and created <laughs> uh, and created over and over again uh, and changes and its relevance changes depending on how we're we're building the story of this grazing and agricultural and ecosystem situation so uh, I just love how this project is so uh, slow and deep in that work uh, and also you pointed out a few times how there's seem to be sort of immediate deliverables even though it's this slow work over many years there are productive things happening from it every day uh, and I wanted to point out again in terms of thinking of scalability or growing or, or moving at all uh, a way of thinking about building relationships where you're trying to organize people in the world towards certain priorities is thinking about uh, moving at the speed of trust. And uh, I wanted to offer that. So that's the philosophical take. And I think it's, you know, knowledge, make, we, the material world shapes knowledge, and then the way we think about knowledge shapes the material world. So happy to hear any thoughts or, or feedback on any of that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Spoken like a true agroecology student. <laughs> um, yeah, so first of all, I, I definitely agree. And I think that being a grad student in agroecology, when I tell people that's what I'm studying, usually they say, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and usually what I do is I just describe this project that I'm working on. I'm like, that's agroecology. 
this is agroecology. And then um, I like the idea of working at the speed of trust. And I think that so far, I think that's really what this project has been doing. And I think that's essential because I think if any of this starts happening faster than the speed of trust, all kinds of bad things are going to start happening as, as they would with any project. So I think that's a real strength of, of the people we have up here and in the room. And I think early on when we met, we both agreed that, right yeah. uh, you know, my concerns with working with the personality, you know, I, you know, we didn't know each other is, and we both agreed that no matter what happens, if, if, if something goes bad, let's talk to each other first <laughs> and, and figure it out and let's not hang each other out to dry because yeah. it, it, it would be counterproductive for anything. So, uh, and frankly, if, if we see an issue, I have to talk to him. I, I didn't anticipate talking to him as much. I don't talk to my boss as much as I talk to Bill during the grazing season. So it's just having those conversations and making sure that I share with him the things that I'm seeing and that I have concern before they get down a road where just to be honest, building that trust, building that honesty. Yep. I think we're going to take this last uh, Zoom question uh, from Dana. Uh, where can a person find information on whether there are DNR grassland projects uh, comparable, uh, contemplate, contemplated. contemplated, thank you, in our area? Contemplated? I'm not, I'm not sure. Tim, does that exist? Oh, um, well, um, probably the simplest thing would just be to get in touch with Aaron and myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because every year we're contemplating these <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of contemplation. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the department, uh, any one of our biologists in the group of contact, yep. um, we're trying to add very slowly using our trust method, uh, learning as we go, four to six sites a year, um, appropriate sites. We also talk about partnering with UW to develop a model that helps us uh, using GIS identify good sites for grazing going forward uh, to help us you know, in our contemplation of where we might be grazing in the future. So I think a phone call to the DNR is where it would start and, and perhaps even an idea might come from a farmer out there, a site that we haven't considered. So yeah. So if I could really quickly, sorry, Alan. No, no, um, folks have, be, uh, speaking at Grassworks and other events, you know, I've got, been approached by some folks and had the conversation of they're super interested, they're really far from me, but been able to connect them with the county biologist or county technician that is closer to them to start that conversation. So please, I'm more than happy to be that facilitator um, and do that for folks. It's a process, but I'm happy to be that person. I'm not sure how much of it came through the microphone, um, but that was Tim Lazat uh, speaking in the back. He's been really uh, instrumental in this project. He's with the um, Department of Natural Resources. And to that question about um, how do we find out uh, what places are being contemplated, he responded, well, you can give us a call. And like, it's pretty nice to know there's actually people to talk to at the Department of Natural Resources that uh, know a lot about this project. So. Um, I would say um, Aaron and Tim right now are, um, you know, key players, but um, with the grazing specialists coming online, hopefully in the next month or so, um, I guess it's a conservation agriculture specialist, yep. but I think of it as a grazing specialist <laughs> <laughs> for now, from my biased point of view, uh, would, um, you know, hopefully be a great central point of contact for um, kind of the direction and, and future contemplations of the project. Great. I think that'll be a good question to end on. If uh, we're all going to be down in the rat, I think everyone here is going to be down there for at least a little bit. So if you have more questions, we can chat down there. But we hope you can all uh, make it to our next event, which is on May 17th. Um, our host for that month is going to be the Department of Landscape, um, Department of Planning and Landscape Architecture. And the title is going to be Citizens Owning Local Food Science, Empowering Farmers Market Managers Around Data with Professor Alfonso Morales and his guests. Um, so just watch your email and our Facebook page for more info. Thank you guys all so much for uh, coming out today. And thanks to our Zoom audience. Head down to the rat. <laughs>